Oh, look who we got here today. Welcome, Mr. Ian Pace of Deep Purple to Linear Rock. Always a pleasure to have you in Italy. You come here very often. So I, I come here whenever I can, yeah. Concerts, interviews, clinics. And um, guesting with some local Italian musicians, which I've got yes. a great, great many friends here who play really well. And they give me the chance to, to play at a time when Deep Purple would not be touring. And this is very important, so I can remember what to do. <laughs> so, so you have a special connection with Italy, you, uh, we, we can say that? Yeah, um, I, I tend to work with more Italian musicians uh, than anywhere else. Um, and I, I was just talking to somebody years ago, before Deep Purple, I was, I was in this wonderful town, Milan, for three months. I was working at the Piccolo Teatro. Uh, yes. Uh, the, the band I was in, we provided music for a stage play. I mean, it was very strange. We had to do seven songs a night in Italian. Wow. The singer didn't know what he was singing about. And the, the director of the show didn't want uh, the keyboards or the drums on stage to detract from the play. So myself and the keyboard player, we played behind the fire curtain at the back. And at the end of the show, when we used to come and take the bow, you could see all the audience going, who's that? I didn't see him, I didn't see him. <laughs> And it got so depressing in the end. We used to we used to just lie in bed all day in the hotel, and we'd just put a coat on, still in our pajamas, and go and play the show, uh -huh. and then just get changed to do the bow, <laughs> and then go back into pajamas and back to the hotel again. <laughs> but you have good memories. Oh, Those yeah, were yeah. the sixties, right? That was sixty-seven. One year Six before Deep Purple. Wow. Yeah. Okay. But yeah. you are here in Italy yeah. today to promote a new album See. of Deep Purple, which is coming out very soon in about. Month. Well, the end of this month, month, yeah. End okay. of this month, yeah. And uh, so, 19th record for the band, and uh, now what is the title? Mm -hmm. And it's been like eight years yeah. since you've done your last record. What happened in between? I mean, it was like a, a low inspiration in this period. You you were busy in other projects, concerts, or what happened? Um, well, for the last ten years, we have been touring extensively, and that means six, seven months a year on the road, away from home, away from family, away from other business interests that, you know, happen as you get older. And there just wasn't time to, to, to contemplate making a record. And there wasn't the desire, because most of the life was already taken with the, with the, the touring schedule. Um, but in 2011, we decided that we would uh, make an easier year in 2012. We had one little concert tour in Canada at the beginning, and we had some things planned in Europe for the end. But in the middle, we decided to take eight, eight months off with nothing. You know. Okay. Um, now you cannot let this time be non-productive. Uh, so it seemed, as we had the time, it might be a good idea to think: Would we like to make another record? And as we had no um, time limitation then. Um, everybody was quite willing to, to try to create some new music and then record it. Because um, it's very difficult if you, if you only have one, two months between tours to, to have the, the, the right feeling to create new music and then record it in a relaxed fashion. When you don't have this deadline, you must finish now because next day you have to go around the world and play a concert. So this was easy. And once we'd uh, made the decision that we'd like to try and do it. Uh, obviously the rumour in the business got round and we got uh, contacted by Bob Ezrin, a legendary producer. Yeah. And he basically said, uh, if you think I would be of any help to you, I'd like to be involved in the project. Um, so he managed to get a meeting together with Bob. He came, and see, he came to see a concert in Toronto. The next morning we had a meeting. And having seen us on stage, uh, what, I, what I think we need to do we don't need to make a studio, studio album. We need to make a live studio album. New music, but um, making a record in the old fashioned way where everybody is in the studio playing together. The instrumentals, you know. And to try and capture some of that uh, free form creativity and excitement that you get from a live show. Which when you, when you create records in the modern way with one guy playing and another guy, it's very, very difficult to get any excitement. You get perfection, yeah. but it's not exciting. Um, anyway, so once we once we realised we were all thinking in the 
in the same direction that for, the, for an album. Then it was fairly simple to get the process um, going. We took uh, two weeks in a big sound stage in central Germany. We just locked ourselves away and we just put ideas in. Yeah. Ideas that would become little baby songs. And at the end of the two weeks, I think it wasn't even two weeks, ten days, um, we had 14 ideas we thought were good. You know, sometimes it would start with a drum pattern, sometimes it would be a little idea Steve had brought in, sometimes we, a bass riff that Roger... They were just music by committee, but a very, very friendly, happy committee. And uh, when we, uh, we sent these demo tapes over to um, Bob and to Ian Gillen, and everybody liked what, what was happening, uh, so then it just needed um, Bob to use his knowledge of finding the right studio uh, to capture the sound correctly and a, lot, and a big enough studio for us to be in the same room because most studios are like this now it's all for electronics you yeah, know? yeah yeah okay a bit bigger than this but not, <laughs> okay. but not much um, so we found this great great studio in Nashville called the tracking room and it's an old style studio it's probably 30 meters long 15, 16 meters wide, two stories high, okay. and you can all get in there and you can make music. Um, we took a week of pre-production in Nashville just to fine tune and arrange the songs a little more correctly. And then we went in the studio and the basic uh, backing tracks were cut in 10 days. Very, very quick. And that, that can happen when the ideas are good. Uh, you are excited about playing them, you're interested in playing them. You've got a great studio which gives you a great sound immediately. You know, within two hours of setting up the drums, we were recording. Yeah. That quickly. And, so uh, you worked on the songs in the studio? Well, bringing, or very, no, most of the work was done before we hit the studio. Okay. Most of the, the serious work was that one week before the studio. Uh, but by that time, you, you okay, you you don't know the songs the same way you know the old songs but you know them well enough that you can get through the recording process um, and because the ideas were so strong uh, and the sound was so good quickly uh, we were able to do nearly every every song was done in one two or three takes there wasn't time to get bored with the song you know when you when you play something twenty times you're not in the act of creation anymore. You're in the act of recreation. Because when you've done it that many times, you start thinking, what did I do last time? And you try to copy this. Whereas the first one, two, three times you play it, everything is different and fresh. You have no idea, you have no plan. It just happens. And sometimes that doesn't give you the perfect take. But it gives you the perfect take. Where 20, 20 takes later, it is technically 100%, but it can be sterile. It can be. It can lose that little bit of magic, which makes the difference. Okay. Um, but because we were so happy with the, what, what was going on, the ideas were so well planned. Everything was one, two, three takes, and uh, anything that needed repairing were just little bits here. I may have missed a drum beat and hit the hit. You know, just missed the middle of the drum, and you have to replace things like that. But it was very, very quick. Um, and when you do make a fast record, uh, it's generally a good one. I know uh, Machine Head was done in three weeks with uh, no effort whatsoever and this one uh, it just felt easy to make and that, that generally means good things. And Bob was the perfect man at this point of your career? I mean when he, he actually called you and yeah. said I'm available, yeah, I mean, yeah. you well, immediately knew he was the uh, best? Well we knew if we, if, if we could get Bob uh, interested the very very least we would get would be a good sounding record um, but I'd never worked with Bob before but what we found out to our delight was not only is he a good producer great producer he has a great musical mind too his knowledge of music is extensive and he can he can explain to you in a musical way if you're doing something wrong it's no good somebody comes out of the control and says it's not working I don't and you ask him why, and he says, I don't know. Bob was say, it's not working because you've changed this. That, that chord there, you've changed it, it shouldn't be that way. That drum fill doesn't work. He would tell you a musical way where you just 
gone down the wrong road. He pulled you back. Yeah. And it and when he told you in the musical way it made sense and you understood and you could get and you could carry on and get it done quickly. So that was really very valuable. And a couple of moments of uh in the uh pre production room where Bob would uh, get involved in a very, very light way with with the composition. You know, he would uh, add his musical feeling of from without the band, outside, looking in. Where, where he saw something was maybe not quite as good as something else, he would suggest something else and change it around. So that was really very refreshing. The song Hell to Pay uh, yeah. has a children choir in it. Uh, which was Bob idea? Oh yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> once we've done our once we've done our, our tracks, uh, we let Bob get on with his creative side. You know, um, it's trust. You trust him to do the right thing. You know. Um, the next thing, once I once I'd finished my tracks, I went home, and the next thing I heard was all the other things that he'd added to it. That's okay. And then the next thing I heard was when Ian had done the vocals. You know, I must say my bit was ten days. I was in and out of the studio and back home with my family. But uh, that, that's the way I like it. You know, I, I, there's no point in me hanging around the studio just watching the other guys work. But it, you know, we trusted Bob to do a really good job, and that's exactly what he did. And uh, I'd like to think sometime we'd work together in the future because I think we both had a good time. He enjoyed it. We certainly did. There's um, a special song on this new album, Alive and Beyond, which is dedicated to John Lord. Mm -hmm. um, how the song was inspired by, I mean, what happened and um, is that, I mean, will you play it live also? Do you have anything special in mind? Um, there are two or three pieces on, on the album which they relate to John. Uh, I mean, that is one song where it has um, the spirit of John in it. But there's another one which is Uncommon Man, where the intro to that, which is about two minutes long, was an idea conceived by by John and Steve in a freeform solo part of the stage show, which we still knew, use now with Don and Steve. And uh, we got the track finished, and Bob said it needs something at the beginning. It needs it needs something to set it up. And he'd, he'd seen us do the concert. He said, "Why don't you take that freeform idea?" and put it in the context of Uncommon Man. So Don and Steve went in the studio and Bob told me to go in and just make some dramatic effects with the drums. And basically Don and Steve, they chose a chord and everything they played was a relative note to this chord. So within the structure of that, they were totally free to go where they wanted with each other. And the that glorious two, two minutes of music took exactly two minutes to record, one take, totally live, went in and listened to it in the control room, it was just absolutely wonderful. Bob stuck it on the front of the song and it's just like it was there always. Wow. Yeah. Um, but above and beyond, it's a, it's a waltz, it's a 3-4 tempo, that time signature. Uh, and when once I'd gone back to England, I said, no, I've no, I had no idea what Ian and Roger were, no, were going to create for the, for the lyrics. No idea. And I was so happily surprised when it, I heard the finished thing, because it's not what you'd expect it to be. It's not a rock and roll song. But it is. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's got so much uh, in common with old Celtic folk songs. And it has a wonderful charm because of it very simple little story but it just it just sort of works and it's the sort of thing that would not be obvious to do the obvious thing would have been less interesting but this simple little idea made this wonderful loping three-fourth track mm -hmm. just a, a really nice piece of music John was like um, a brother for you all, especially for you. Yeah. Ian, you had a really special relation with him. Um, I'm sure you have a lot of memories about mm -hmm. him. Is there any snapshot about him that you want to share with us? First thing that comes to your mind right now. Um, John, John had two sides to his character. When he was socializing, he was in, incredibly gentle and friendly and funny and entertaining 
and when he was a musician he could be incredibly stubborn. Uh, uh, he, he didn't uh, bend very much musically, he, you know, he knew what he wanted and, and sort of stuck to it. Uh, so those were the two sides of his character, but to socialize with him was a joy. He was a pure raconteur, he could tell stories all night long, and he was ever the gentleman, and uh, he liked being the gentleman too. Okay. Um, you are the only member of Deep Purple at the moment, and has been in the band since the very beginning, and on whole album, on the whole discography. Yeah. Um, what's the secret, Ian? <laughs> and uh, do you really feel that this is your family? Um, I've worked with other people, you know, in times when Deep Purple has not been an, an yeah. entity or when we've been had time off, I've worked with other people and I've enjoyed it all. You know, I had a great time with White Snake. I never laughed so much in my life. It was the funniest band in the world. Yeah. I had a good time with Gary Moore. That was very interesting. I had a lovely time with Paul McCartney. Um, but Purple is like going home. You know, whatever Purple is, it's something that I help create and it's mine. With other people, I'm just helping them create their thing. And that is a different, that's a different thing entirely, you know. I enjoy it, but it's not mine, it's theirs. Okay. Purple is mine. And uh, for good, bad or indifferent, I'm very proud of it. You know, it's, uh, it's created my life. And when I talk to fans of the band, I realize after all these years that it's, it's touched a lot of people and made them happier people. There's something in their life we did which they enjoyed. And that's a pretty nice thing to uh, to think about, you know. Because that wasn't, the, you know, the intention when, you, when you're a kid, you do it for me, you know, doing it, everything for me. But later on you realize that you, you created something which was important to a lot of people in a good way. And uh, I think that's really pretty cool. So you mentioned White Snake and War Band mm. and uh, Paul McCartney, uh, which are some of the things that you've done beside Deep Purple. Yeah. Is there any of this experience that uh, you consider that belonged more to, that you felt, you know, yours the, the most, apart uh, from Deep yeah. Purple? Um, uh, obviously the White Snake time was good because a lot of the music, again, was created in a very similar way to Deep Purple. A lot of it wasn't. A lot of it was Bernie Marsden songs and, and David Coverdale songs. Mm -hmm. But some of the tracks were created in the same way. So I have uh, quite an affinity to them. Uh, I wouldn't do it again because I, I, it, at the time I didn't believe it should be called White Snake. It should have been called David Coverdale because it was David's band. Um, and uh, as much as I don't mind being a sideman for a little while, I, I, that's not what I do. You know, I will, I will guess with somebody for a while, but uh, I'm the drummer with Deep Purple, and that's that's a different level. A new tour is about to start. Yeah. Um, first of all, uh, about I want to know something if you can share with us about the set list. I, I think it's a nightmare all the time, you know, when you have to compile that because you have a lot of classics. And But this new album, as you already said, is very fresh and reminds of the 70s. Yeah. So the new songs maybe will melt perfectly with the classics. So maybe it will be easier this time. I don't know. What do you it's think? It's <laughs> never easier because <laughs> if you bring one song in, you have to leave another song out. Yeah. You only have so much time to fill yeah. in a night. Um, when we get into rehearsals at the end of this month, we will, we will f try the songs that we think have the possibility to go from the studio to the stage. Because not every piece of music can do that. They just don't work the same way. Um, and we will probably select the best two or three, the most immediate ones of the new album and try and incorporate those into the show without uh, losing any of the classics that we know people want to hear. Um, it's difficult, not impossible. You just have to work it correctly. And you have to be very cruel. You have to say, well, this song is not so important, so this one goes to get this new song in. Um, but uh, it's, it's a very, very um, delicate subject. I remember a few years ago, David Bowie had released a new record, and he tried to play the whole record, and none of the old things, and people didn't like it. Yeah. Within three days, he put the old songs in again, because he's not a stupid man. The audience are there for 
two reasons. They, okay, they're there because they still like you, but they do want to hear the history, and you can't blame them for that. You know, you are duty bound to give them a value for their money and make them happy. But you also need to be able to play new music to them. So it's this balance. You know, we we say you know if you've got a little baby song, if you surround it by its big brothers, it's okay. 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 But when you play three, four baby songs together that the audience don't know so well, then it's 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 tough on the baby songs. But when you surround them with the, with the with the, the more well known things, people accept them more readily. You know, um, so that's what we'll we'll try to we'll pick the best two or three, maybe four, depends how well it works out, and they will be surrounded by the classics, and uh, okay. we hope that they will feel at home in there. And grow up to be big songs. Okay. And from a drummer point of view, uh, which are the songs that still gives you chills to play live from Deep Purple discography? Um, it really does change, you know. It changes on your emotion of the night. It changes on the sound you have in each different venue. Sometimes um, you have a day like this, you're really up, and you'll, you'll get more out of a fast, exciting rock tune. Another day you're a little more relaxed and you prefer a groove. Sometimes the sound is horrible and you don't want to play at all mm -hmm. and you just do a professional job, you do what you can. Other days the sound is great and you will enjoy the songs where the drums can do more. You're hearing a sound you love that makes you happy and you, you want to play things. Um, it's not an exact science, you know, we have the same great equipment every night but what we cannot control is the, the room we play in. Sometimes these places are magnificent, and sometimes they're terrible. And there's nothing you can do to change it. When it's a bad night, you become the professional guy, and you do the best job you can for those people. But sometimes you don't enjoy it, you know. And it's, it's just one of those things. Next night, do the same thing in a different hall, and it's easy and, and great fun. You are considered one of the most influential drummers of all time, not only in rock music. Um, was this actually your ambition when you very first started, or, or not? No, no. <laughs> um, you know, I'm, I'm a realist. I know how many great, great drummers there are around the world. And I don't consider myself one of them. I consider myself okay. There's things I can do, things I can't do. The most important thing I can do is make people enjoy watching me play. I don't know why that is. I'm happy that they do enjoy what I do. Um, for me, drumming has always been a hobby. It's not, a, not an obsession, you know. Um, if it was an obsession, I would be a better drummer than I am now. I would work harder at it but I wouldn't enjoy it as much. So when I go on stage five, six nights a week for two hours, I am that 15-year-old kid again, the one that started playing drums in a village pub. You know, um, I did it then because it made me happy. It's become my life, it's become my business, but it still makes me happy, you know. Um, whereas when you're a kid, you play when you want to, and when you don't want to play, you don't play. When it's your business, sometimes you have to play when you don't want to play, but that's, that's just the nature of the thing. But uh, usually, once I, once I sit down behind the kit, all the other stuff goes away and I'm happy. You know? Okay. There are also a lot of jokes about drummers. You know, everybody no. says that, you know, the craziest in the band yeah. is the drummer. Or, you know, who's, what, what's the guy that's hanging out, you know, without a musician, yeah. it's the drummer. Okay. So, uh, is there anything that you can say to defend the category and... Uh, oh, it's a very simple, simple <laughs> one. The drummer's job is secure. Will, there will always be a drummer, and the simple reason is you cannot borrow 50 euros from the drum machine. You can always borrow 50 euros from the drummer. <laughs> okay, that's a good one. Um, in 1992, uh, you took part to a tribute to John Bonham, um, mm -hmm. playing the Rover from Physical yeah. Graffiti. Um, what I would like to ask you is, which is your point of view about, you know, that eternal clash of titans between you, Ian, and John Bonham, and, you know, between Deep Purple and Led Zeppelin, which seems are two different schools, you know? Yeah. <laughs> um, 
As far as the musicians were concerned, there was no clash, no nothing. Okay. The fact that we came from the same country at a similar time, uh, that's, just a, that's just history. But uh, Zeppelin approached it one way and we approached it another. And what we both did, uh, people seemed to like. Um, I love Zeppelin. I thought they were a magnificent band. Um, and John was a friend of mine. I mean, not a close hello every day sort of friend, but when we saw each other, it was always nice to see each other. And uh, what he created in drumming was, was glorious. He, without intention, he simplified heavy rock and roll drumming down to its basic components. And every note he played was an important note. But if it didn't need playing, he didn't play it. And what he had was this wonderful groove and this amazing sound. And people today are still trying to get bon Bonham's drum sound. They never quite get it because they're not Bonham. You can, you can get close, but so much of what, what drum sounds are are created by the man and not the instrument. It, with John, it, it was how hard he hit them, how he tuned them, where he hit them, how fast the stick came away. All these things are totally unique to a drummer. And every one of those things is part of what creates the sound. And uh, John just had that. It was wonderful. Nothing but, you know, love and respect for that and, and for so much of what Zeppelin did, which was just wonderfully musical. Uh, and it, when it needed to be not musical, it was wonderfully aggressive. Uh, uh, wonderful. Yeah. So you are left-handed, mm -hmm. and your drum style is very fast and smooth, and you're able to do things with just one hand and one foot that mm -hmm. you know a lot of other drummers cannot do with two. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, do you still actually practice every day for hours, or it's you know just no, I, natural I talent that you must have? I never practiced every day for hours. I never had time. Okay. Uh, I got my first drum kit when I was 15 years old, my 15th birthday, and started playing with a little local cover band, like every kid does. Yeah. But I had a job in the daytime, and I lived in a very small house, so you couldn't, with other houses connected, so you couldn't play drums. So the only time I played was in the rehearsal room or on stage with my friends. And I did that two or three nights a week, every week. That was enough work there for little kids to do that. And when I was 17, I turned professional, and I was playing seven nights a week, and traveling. So there was never time to sit and learn in a practice room. I was always learning on stage. Um, now, for that to work, you have to have a latent talent, which is sort of almost immediate. And then all, you, all you're really doing is uh, improving on that by taking in more information. Because every night you'd be working with one, two more bands, so you'd see one or two different drummers every night. And they may have 90% rubbish, but 10% of good stuff. So you try and take that good stuff and you bring it all into your style. Um, and when the, when the field you take from is big enough, you end up with your own style. If you only take from one or two places, it's obvious you sound like somebody else because you, you're trying to be Bonham, you're trying to be Keith Moon, you're trying to be Ginger Baker. But when you take from Buddy Rich, when you take some sort of orchestral plays, when you take from a country player, when you take from Bonham, the levels of each input are different, so you end up with your own style. And the things that were important to me uh, was that the, the, the drums had to swing. They had to make a communication on a very primitive level not just going bang, bang, bang. They had to create something that made you want to do that. Because that's what they did to me, for the guys I listened to. And I found it much more interesting to think in patterns, with, with the bass drum especially, than just playing time. So I would try be trying to find odd places to put the beats and trying to get a little more control with the foot to be able to do some of the faster things in certain areas. It seems to be less important now um, because it's a lot easier to to create these things with, with the double pedals. We can do a lot more, um, but sometimes we do too much. And the magic of one bass drum pedal is that 
you have to think in patterns. You have to think in terms of the music. You have to know where you hit and where you don't hit. And that is all part of the drummer being a musician, not just a hitter. Because if you're playing music, everything will sound better. If you're just a timekeeper, it's okay. Yeah. Okay, so Deep Purple had a lot of different lineups, Mark 1, Mark 2, Mark 3, Mark 4, and so on. Uh, is there any mark that uh, still, you know, you have by the heart that you still prefer, that you think that was actually the best from your point of view? No, I wouldn't look at it like that. The most exciting okay. was obviously when Mark II was formed and the direction of the band changed just because 40% of the, the personnel had changed. Ian and Roger came in and just the way Roger played and the way Ian sang and the ability of his voice to do different things meant that the music was being created a different way. Uh, and uh, it was fun to do that, but it was also, uh, at that moment, we realized that what, it, what we were doing was exactly the right thing at the right time for a lot of people. And that moment of knowledge that people are taking notice of what you're doing, are enjoying it, and they are elevating you to another level. It's nothing to do with you. you. You played the music the only way you could. For these five people, this is the solution they came up with. Um, and that, that realization that you actually are doing something that people like and are taking note of, that's very exciting. You know? But that doesn't make one band better than the other. It was just a time. And uh, I would think you ask any artist, when they realize that their career has a chance to be successful. That is a very exciting thought thing to go in your head. So you're here presenting the new record, mm -hmm. as we already said. Now what? Um, a lot of classic bands actually are, you know, making statement in the last few months or even years, uh, telling that you know making new music mm -hmm. is not worth anymore. That doesn't make sense anymore because you don't sell records anymore because the people want the classics when you play live. Yeah. So. Um, why for Deep Purple, you know, it's not like that? Because you always produce a lot of music through the years. Maybe, you know, some periods was, mm -hmm. you know, top of inspiration, maybe less, but you kept it on, so. Well, we still have a, a massive fan base, and I think they're interested when we come up with something new. Um, they've been with us a long time. Uh, some of them, from, from as long as they've been born, because some are only 16, 17 years old. Yeah. You know, some guys at the back of all are 65 years old, but they all they all like the same thing, and they all come to come to enjoy a purple concert. Um, it's I don't know how to say this. It's the spirit of the band is what keeps it all going, and the spirit of the band means that new music has to be created every now and again. Um, yes, it's less important than it was new records. Um, it's a shame because I remember as a kid uh, waiting for the next Beatles album was great, and you didn't have to wait very long. Yes. Yeah, um, because that was that was how you, how you worked. You you toured to promote a record. Now you make a record to promote a tour, okay. and it is different. Um, there are enough people out there who will legitimately buy a Deep Purple new record to make the finances for the record company and all the promotion that goes with it viable, to make it work, you know. Sure, you know, there are lots of people who will steal it. That's the world we live in. Yes. Um, there's nothing you can do about it, there's nothing you can... I mean, back in the days when these were the records and somebody brought out the first cassette recorder, or somebody made a cassette copy of the record. Now, everybody thought that was okay, but it wasn't. That was illegal too. When you buy the record, this was the only way you were allowed to play it, by law. Now, we were, so we've had pirating since little cassette players. So it's just now it's on a, it's on a level where it's far more um, prevalent. It's, it's, a, it's, it's, it's there. It's the world we live in. 
But most of your genuine fans, they will, they will buy the record properly because they want to own everything about it. And there's enough of them to make, make it possible for us to, in collaboration with the record companies, spend the money we need to produce something that people will like. Yeah. You know? And for the people who steal it, well, they'll steal anything. So it makes no difference. You, know, you, can't, you can't control that. And the title, Now What, has something to do with, you know, what we just said. Well, I mean, or when you started, like, you know, Now What? <laughs> this well, is the 19th record. <laughs> it was, yeah, well, it was an Ian Gillen idea. Uh -huh. And when we were thinking about titles for the record, everybody was coming up with different ideas. And nobody actually had an idea that everybody liked. And uh, eventually, Ian just was more strong about, he said, I, this, is, this is the one, this is what you're going to be called. And eventually we said, look, you feel strongly about it, I don't care anymore. It's got to be called something, uh, you have it, you know. Uh, because although it means very little at the moment, in a year's time, it'll be the Now What album. And people won't think about it, you know. I mean, this, in 1968, 69, Book of Talisman, what did that mean? Yeah. But it becomes something when it becomes physical and when you know it. So the actual name really isn't that important. It's got to be something, it's now one. Okay. And it'll, be, it'll become part of the purple history the way everything else has. Okay. Yeah. And did you ever wonder, you know, when the new tour is about to come, now what? Is it still well, work to go on and you well, know, yeah, and on that, and on? That, that was Ian's, <laughs> Ian's thing. We've done everything. Now what? Yeah. We do it again. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so it's still. I mean, for you, it's still uh, like the the most exciting thing yeah. in the world. Yeah. Well, I say when I was fifteen, I played drums because I liked it. And I still like it, and I know that one day it will be finished, and then I'll be really sorry and I'll really miss it. So while I can do it, and I still enjoy it, I want to keep doing it as long as I can, you know, because it makes me happy. And the byproduct of that is it makes other people happy too. And it's some, you know, in this world, there's a lot of stuff out there that makes you unhappy. So if we can be part of the other side, we can be on the good guy's side, then that's okay. And I keep being the good guy as long as I can. Did you imagine to have such a long and strong career? I don't think anybody thinks that way. Mm -hmm. When you're a kid, of course, you're just having fun. And if you're lucky enough to get successful, the, the success creeps up. You don't see it. It's like, <laughs> and then you're successful, you know. Yeah. That much or that, it depends. Yeah. But, you know, when you, when you see young kids, they're, they're looking for success. Uh, and maybe for the wrong reason. They never find it. It finds you. It, tell, it makes its own choices, you know. And it can be as simple as you have a voice that people like, or you can do something that nobody else can do, but it, it's, it's, it's beyond your control. You see people striving after this elusive fame and fortune and success, they never find it. They might, they might touch it for a little while and then it goes away. Yeah. If, it's, if it's part, part of what you, if what you do is natural to you, and people believe that what you're doing, you're doing because you love it, and you communicate something, then that, you might get that tap on the shoulder. Yeah. Okay. So Mr. Ian Pace, thanks very much for your time. Pleasure. And always a pleasure for us to have you back to Italy. And hope to have you back to Linear Rock soon. Yeah, Thank been you. good. Thank you. Good Thank time. you so much. Okay.